And so I look at everything now from a different perspective, which was before, like you mentioned, I need to get this. I don't care how I get this. I just want to get this to this is a learning opportunity, even if I don't get it. So you kind of end up winning no matter what you do, if you start to have that approach to stuff and are, are much more process oriented and less like if you focus on like only the goal, you're not really getting better at, at producing results. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Chat with Nomads. Today we have the famous Balkan Nomad, Steve Sanstransky. Hi Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you man. How's it going? Good, good. So Steve and I actually stay pretty close to each other in Zagreb right now. Our balconies are actually facing each other and last night we like, were trying to... Pretty much... <laughs> if we I look out the window and down, down I, can, I can see you pretty much. Yeah, we're just turning on and off our lights to figure out where each, each of us were. We're like, oh, there, there, there. That was damn funny. I didn't realize you were so close. Like, I knew you were, like, in the neighborhood, but I didn't realize you were, like, in, like, the actual same block of buildings that I'm in. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I saw I, you when you passed me your address, I was quite surprised. It's like, I, I should be able to see his balcony if he's facing, like, the back because... <laughs> Like from the map, it was like a diagonal cut across the quadrants courtyard, basically, right? Yeah. It's, so that's, what is it? Are our buildings actually like connected internally here? I knew, I never even thought to check. I think they are because there's an exit into the courtyard from my, just from like a, the, the bottom floor. I only see a low wall in the courtyard. I don't see like a high blockage. You know, like if I wanted to climb over someone's wall, it's probably doable. Yes, we, might, we, might, we might just we might we might just meet for a coffee out here afterwards and I'll just come down. <laughs> Done. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, Steve. So let's start. Let's start by having you talk about yourself. Tell us a bit more about you. Okay. Um, so let's see. In in brief, I, I work in content creation. So I'm a writer, video producer, and photographer. Mainly before the pandemic, I was mostly actually exclusively I was um, video producer and photographer. The pandemic sort of made me switch and opened up a whole actually a lot more opportunities with work and actually made my work uh sort of explode um in the last two years when i switched or added writing as, as a speciality so that that's sort of the work the work side of things i've been traveling for quite a while partially nomadically partially was related to work so i Going way back to when I finished university, I moved to Colorado after I finished school to be a ski bum for a little bit, worked in, in Aspen, moved to New Zealand for a, a year after that to continue that, worked at a ski resort, then traveled, came back to New York and New Jersey area, worked in a video production and, and filmmaking and stuff like that, and then got a job with uh, Royal Caribbean, which I was traveling all the time for that, and uh, in between contracts, I would travel moved to a different cruise line, did the same thing, and then started doing like one month per country. And that was just before the pandemic. So I was here in Croatia, I was in Ukraine and Mexico. Uh, and then that kind of ended abruptly when, when the world shut. And then sort of fast forward to now, and uh, I, I picked up writing, moved to Croatia in December, and now basically we've been here one year. Nice, nice. Yeah, I was curious to know a bit more about like, life before Croatia because obviously most of your stuff on the media is life after Croatia right and I was wondering like did you only start nomading after Croatia or before that because I know that you traveled a bit but I wasn't like too sure on like what was the method you were traveling on but it seems now that you are mainly in the hospitality industry doing content creation and therefore the travel kind of falls into the scope of work as well is it yeah yeah. so with uh I I kind of are grew up thinking that I should be traveling because um, my parents, every time there was like a break from school, they're like, oh, we're going to take a road trip to, you know, South Carolina or to Florida. We're going to go on a, a cruise in the Caribbean or some, something like that. They're always like, we need to go spend free time experiencing things and learning things and being introduced to different things in the world. So it was natural for me as I grew up, I'm like I got to, now I got to find a way to do this and make money. Um, so before nomading i was basically trying to find ways to work in the trial industry so that ended up being I, I, for royal caribbean i was a digital content specialist so i was like managing their onboard digital marketing on all the digital displays they had on the ships for msc i was a multimedia producer so i was making content that was related to travel 
or related to their product uh, on board. And then in between that, I was doing adventure tourism videos. So I did, um, let's see, company called Trekking Hero. I did a Kilimanjaro video for them. Um, Himalayan Wonders, I did a Everest-based camp trek video for them. So I was always basically trying to find my way into work that was allowing me to travel. So it wasn't nomadic quite. Like I had no control over it really. Now I have control over it because I, instead of working for companies directly um, for a huge company, I'm freelancing for, for clients now and I have full control over where I go, which is much nicer. Um, but that's sort of the, the story of, of how I traveled so much in the past 10 years. Oh, nice. And, and what's the, do you prefer, you were saying that there's more freedom, obviously, but it sounds like you did some really interesting stuff as well with the companies that were in tourism, because obviously Cliff and Jero and going on cruises and understanding, being able to meet also other travelers, that must be kind of fun as well. Like uh, what's the, what's the main difference you are seeing between the two? Between, between like a, a cruise line and then this, this type of travel you mean? Yeah, yeah, like working in the yeah. hospitality industry and traveling uh, versus free. It was, yeah. it's distinctly different. I mean, it's, I, li- I like this a lot more because uh, the control aspect of it is what, what, I, what I like initially was where with, with working for a big company or doing a, a contract for a video production somewhere, like you, you are tied to that particular place for that length of time. And then you, you basically have to leave or figure out how to stay afterwards because you're not really creating your, your own income continuously. You're just doing a project or a contract. Um, so it's cool because you're still getting to experience things, meet people, do things of that nature, but you lack a certain sense of continuous community, I think. Because um, if you're on a four to six month contract, you're with people that might be there the whole time, but there's a lot of coming and going with here. Similar, you have people coming and going in, in Zagreb, for example, I was in Split earlier in the year, but it's much easier to, I think, connect with people um, because you guys are all free to sort of make your own schedules. And if someone wants to stay for a little bit longer, they stay a little bit longer. Like you're, I think you're going to be end up staying in Croatia for a bit longer than planned because you have the freedom to decide that. So with that, I think comes a, a deeper connection with people um, and, a, and a stronger community in the places that people travel to um, as nomads. So that's, I think, the difference in how, how they both play out, I guess. Got it, got it. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a very interesting perspective because I think the idea of having a community was always a bit on the challenging side for nomads, just because like you mentioned uh, that people come and go, but I realized that when you look look at it in comparison with an industry that is also, I would say, more contractual basis, whereby you know people, are, uh, the company is hiring, almost like project contractors for each each projects, and also people do come and go. In relative comparison, this seems to be better because at least people have the freedom to choose whether they want to stay or not. Whereas the other one is more driven by work commitments. People come and going with respect to like when I'm on a ship. I'll put it this way: when I'm on a ship and I want to stay somewhere longer, I don't have the ability to do that. Like if I'm enjoying what I'm doing, like the company has priorities is to make money. I'm just a piece of that machinery that makes money for them, um, as is everybody. And so they don't really care if I like being there or don't like being there. They're like, cool, you're being replaced. Someone else is going to come and do your job and maybe you'll come back. Here, I like Croatia. I like Zagreb. So I can stay, you know, or... Once that, once that runs its course, maybe, then I, I can go somewhere else. And there's so many other places where, as you meet nomads that come through Croatia or anywhere, you learn about places. Like, I didn't know a lot about Bonsko um, at all until talking to people in, in Montenegro. I didn't know about, like, Cyprus being, like, a, a, a pretty decent hub for, for people and all these sorts of new places I never would have even considered until you meet this community of nomads. And it really is actually, like, a global community. You're always sort of maybe traveling solo, but you're not really alone, which I think is, it's not my line. That's something that um, Dean, I think you might know Dean also. He says yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting because I do see like, I think you get a choice to, if you want to go into those nomad hubs whereby most nomads are hanging out. So maybe if you need a community, you head there. And the moment mm. you feel like, you know, I want to have some alone time or like I want to do my own traveling, then you can always go somewhere else whereby it might not be as popular either because of infrastructure or just because it's not as developed yet. 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, well, how long have you been doing, traveling actually? I, you know, you're asking me questions, but I, I don't know how long you've been traveling around. I, I've been traveling in general, like frequently since 2010, I would say, but back mm -hmm. then it was a lot of different capacities. Like I started off as like a backpacker traveler and mm -hmm. you're just trying to, you know, budget and just go around as many places as possible with the lowest budget. And then of yeah. course, as life stages change, I move on to like business travel, expat life. And then uh, yeah. for the nomad life, it's probably around four years uh, where it's yeah. more midterm traveling and stuff like that. Yeah, so, so I like to see different, almost that when I look at travel, I always see different aspects of it just because I've been going around in different capacities. And in mm -hmm. each capacity, you are looking at a different kind of priority, right? Uh, and in fact, these days, just after the pandemic, I was thinking subsequently, I would like to look more into hanging out more with the nomad community. Whereas in the few years before this, I, I generally see myself more as a traveler than a nomad. Like I still love the hostels, uh, mixing with people because there's a, there's a different vibe and story there. But yeah. I think there's another new thing that's coming up in, within the nomad yeah. community that I'll be interested to look into. Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I, so I, I've done backpacking in between other things. So like if I had, I remember I did a project, I think it was like 2012, like a, a long um, post-production editing thing. And I'm like, I need to leave, get away from screens for a little bit. So I went to Central America for, for like a month and just backpack through that. And the experience of, of doing that way different than, than now. I can, now I still, I still like that kind of thing, but I'm so much more interested in like, I would call it either nomad travel or like slow travel where when I was doing all the stuff backpacking, like I was experiencing a lot, but I didn't think I was getting a richness of the culture that you could get when you're in a place for a while. And now plus also what you mentioned with like priorities changing and like work becoming more of a thing. Like, cause I'm, when I was in my twenties, early twenties, I didn't really give, give a shit about work that much. Um, but now I'm like, I, I can't, like I tried one month at a time. Um, before the pandemic and that wasn't even enough because as soon as you get comfortable in your work routine in a place I was here in Zagreb I was in Kiev I was in Playa Carmen as soon as you get comfortable you're like okay well, I gotta pack my shit and, and move and uh so I love this like three month plus I'm, I'm like 12 months now but like I like this you can really get in a sense of the place meet some local people create some some of your own little community amongst local people too and then you know be productive yeah, yeah, actually one thing that I've noticed that's really funny across the years is that the moment you're into slow and long-term travel, right, your perspective of time frame changes like drastically. It's like, yeah. you'll be thinking, okay, I have two days. Should I go to split? <laughs> but then you're like, shit, but two days for split, that's too little. Like, I'm not going because like, I only have two days. I need at least like a week. Whereas yeah. if you think about normal tourists, like a backpacker, they'll be like, yeah, I'm doing one day in Split, one day in Zara, one day in Zagreb, and I'm going. Yeah. So, so here you are wondering, like, why the shit is two days not enough? Suddenly, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a weird. That is a weird. That's a good observation because it's totally true. I definitely in the past, like one day, totally, I could see everything in one day. And now, literally, I think I think you just nailed it. One week, I'm like, oh, I can't go for a week. Should I even go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's like that's the main thing that I'm seeing a big difference. Like. I'm, I, I definitely factor in a lot more time per destination, even though like you can totally do it in like a weekend or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's funny, like the, the industry that I worked in cruising is based on doing stuff in a day. It's like it's that's mm. the whole point of it. Like you go places and which was weird because I I always felt like they're like a fraud a little bit. Like, am I really traveling? Because I'm like, I I'm just I'm not seeing nightlife that much. And but when you do the same itinerary, you at least get a deeper sense of a place so like i was doing the same thing for msc for like two years so i was always in the, in the same places so i felt like okay i guess that counts but other people count it so i'm just being critical <laughs> yeah i i don't really like i don't really think like that's always a big sometimes we think about it ourselves but now that i look at it everyone just travels differently and it's just you know however you you love your travel style to be like just follow whatever you think is the best <laughs> It's just that I think as the, the lifestyle change, I think we didn't do this thinking that the perception will change, you know? It's more like just because the life change, the perception changes accordingly. Um, I, was, I was also going to say like, 
I actually forgot, forgot what I was going to say. I'll come back to it when I remember. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so before you, so before Croatia, you were back in Jersey, right? I know. And before that, you were actually mm -hmm. in Mexico. Yeah. yeah so were so... you like, yeah, were, were you doing like your work stuff in Mexico or was it like the travel that you were talking about? Yeah. So let's see. I left, I left MSC um, in, two, in the middle of 2019. So like, I guess July-ish or late June. And I started a company with my friend, video production company, which doesn't exist anymore um, for a number of reasons. The pandemic put like the final like nail in the coffin of that. But so we started a company, we had some clients, we did some some good videos and, and whatnot. And um, that was like those couple of months in summer, I reconnected with family, came home, visited, and then we started traveling. So we did a, a video in New York and then we moved to Croatia to edit that video. So we're here for a month and then to Kiev and we're doing another video project all remotely. So we were, we were, we were doing stuff. Um, and then by the time we got to Playa del Carmen in January, February ish, uh, that's when you already started to hear the news of like, there's something happening in the world. So like contracts started to like, it got, it got harder to, to land stuff and we were struggling to figure out our own identity. So to answer the question, yes, I was working. Um, I was doing remote stuff and I actually came back to Jersey, not related to the pandemic hitting. I actually had, a, I was supposed to make a music video in New Jersey or New York um, in March of 2020. And so left Mexico, came back and that never happened. That's like, as soon as I came back one week later, done. And then that, that's when all of my work disappeared, like all of it completely. Mm hmm but you were saying, so, so let's talk a bit about the work stuff, right? Because you were saying um, some part of it could be done remotely, but of course, if you are filming, you also need to mm -hmm. probably have some physical uh, interaction with like on the, on the place, right? The, is that the main reason that it just evaporated because like face-to-face -face meetings were no longer possible? Yeah, with, 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 with video. Actually, so it's a, it, it changed my perspective on, on work completely um so the reason yes it, you, you needed face-to-face -face contact for for meetings and stuff in the past and you didn't need it but it was good to have um those real real person meetings and um you had to physically be in the places you were shooting so and then people on top of that marketing budgets for video production kind of disappeared because people it's hard to invest in that if you don't know if you're going to actually be able to bring in physical customers into whatever you're advertising or if you're going to there's the return on investment for any company became much more hard to quantify in that time. So they just said, we're not, we're going to put everything on hold, which whatever that's, you can't blame them for that. So I went from having a feast or famine type of, of existence um, with, with the video production freelancing, which was, we'd have one really good project and then like kind of nothing, and then something good and then like nothing. So it was, stressful it was like you, you never really felt like you had a lot of control over how much money was coming in and recurring clients was not a thing that i was even thinking about even though i've been reading like oh you should just have get recurring clients it just it, that it didn't factor in i was trying to we were trying to hit a home run with every project which we never did so, <laughs> um when i started writing yeah when i started writing um or why, why I picked up writing, actually. I always liked it. I'd, I'd help friends and companies with stuff, giving them opinions, and just, I always liked it. Um, I knew I needed a job that didn't require anything other than a laptop. Like, I didn't have to go shoot anything. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't need to talk to anybody other than, like, these types of interactions. Writing was the only thing that I could see myself investing time into and not hating it. And when you pick something up to make money, you have to it's best if you at least enjoy it because then it does not be miserable to get started. Um, but then my whole focus, as opposed to the feast or famine thing, it was like, I, I only want to find recurring writing clients. Like that was the, the sole focus. I mean, I needed to get a portfolio going. I needed to get some people to hire me. So initially it was like one-off small thing, but the whole intention was get a base salary from recurring clients and grow that. And so now that's kind of what I have. I've not all the clients I started with, but some of the ones I started with way back in the beginning of last year, middle of last year, I, I'm still with because I, I specifically sought that out. So that's why I changed my perspective on work because it's so much more 
like you can breathe a little bit easier. You know, what works there, it gives you time to then sort of like think about scaling and how you can actually grow. Because if you don't have a base of anything, it's hard to just really know what you're even going after. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I do agree that the moment you have like a recurring source or someone that is with you long term or hopefully a few that is with you for the long term, yeah. there's a foundation for you to feel more confident about reinvesting the money to grow the business because you know that, you know, I can at least count on this for like minimally three months and then hopefully longer, obviously, right? Whereas if you're yeah. taking like one-off clients, you will, you never know because you're like, this is just for now and I don't know, like next week or next month, if oh, you think it's going to happen terrible. again. It was ter- yeah, it was terrible because we, and, and since some of the projects that I was doing, I, I really liked and still do like music videos. And so you're not going to really find recurring music video clients unless you're like, you know, working for an agency that does has a label as a client or something like that. Um, so it's hard to just have like how many of those are you going to make in a year as an independent contractor? Uh, not very many is is the answer. Um, <laughs> but with with these with writing, especially, and that was another thing with the pandemic, people needed um, to put their marketing money somewhere, and writing and content creation for social and stuff like that, and and whatnot became people invested in it so it was it was a good place to jump to also right actually i was thinking just now when you were saying like um video editing not really video editing i think i guess you could say you're more into video production which is Mm -hmm. i I would think a next logical jump because obviously i think everything just moved as you you went along but Mm -hmm. i thought during Mm -hmm. the pandemic a lot more content creators as in like not your typical big names are more like, you know, the, the day-to-day, your neighborhood at home person. There was a lot mm-hmm. more content creation happening because back in the pandemic, that was the boom of uh, video consumption through YouTube and stuff like that, right? So I actually do think there was an increase in demand for video editing, as in like not filming, but, you, you know, they mm-hmm. film and then they, they want to find an editor to edit it. I actually think there's a, there's a spike in, in that, that sort of demand during the pandemic. You're probably right, actually. Um, for for what I was, for my mindset at the time, because I also, it, it was partially related to, I was dis, disenchanted with like working in that field for, it, would, it had been like, I don't know, 10 years or something of, of working <laughs> in video. So partially it was like an excuse to stop doing that, um, which it's not that I don't like it because like I, I still shoot photos and edit videos and like shoot it all the time. Like I haven't, two terabyte drive next to me that hits only content from Croatia from the last year. So it's like, I still go out and and do stuff. Um, I realized if I was, if I was going to struggle with something during the pandemic, I wanted it to be a new skill um, also. So yeah, I mean, I, you're, I think you're you're actually, you're definitely right with that. uh, There was a a demand. Uh, What I learned about the demand for video editing on some of these websites like Fiverr and Upwork and stuff is it's really easy to outsource video to really like low, low have low rates. Um, so you could send it to like India or the Philippines and you can get a pretty decent edit back. And for the rates mm-hmm. that I was charging, it was hard for me to get on those platforms and use them in that way. Um, Cause it was much, it was just much easier. So with, with writing, I realized it's harder to send those to to places where people don't have a complete full grasp of the language. They can still write perfectly fine, but to have like the granular knowledge, you need to have somebody that um, sort of really can can get the American market for, for, for marketing. And so that played to my advantage because that's obviously it's what I do. So it was easier to charge higher rates with writing much quicker. Got it, got it. And I, I actually do think writing is a better or a easier skill set to bring and move around with because there's not as much demand on like foul space, internet speed and stuff oh like that. God. Whereas when you're doing you anything, see, I mean, like, like I have, I have like a, just a closet of, of stuff. I have like the, the backpack I carry around to, in addition to all my other, you know, clothes and whatnot, it's just, it's packed full of gear and it's just, it's, a, it's heavy. It's a pain in the ass. Like I like doing it, but it's just... Like, I'm not complaining about it. It's like a good problem to have. But I, I, I love, like today I woke up and I'm, I'm going to 
I'm doing some copywriting today. So it's like make coffee, did the research I need to do. And I'm, after we finish, I'm going to write. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to do yeah. I have to carry stuff all day. Like, yeah. So I'm trying, I'm actually trying to more fully transition out of doing video or, or like re rephrase it. I only want to do video projects that I genuinely like. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas with, with writing, I like all the projects I do. With video, I want to like exclusively focus on content that, that makes me excited. So what I've been doing lately has been that. So it's been a nice mix. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. Like, I mean, the same as when I do graphics, it's also, there's a way more consideration on like, I need like fast Wi-Fi for download and upload. And then, you know, but whereas writing, I, I realize I can even do it while standing in a queue. I can just draft my stuff right on my mobile and phone. And it's so have, much more versatile. I never, I have a friend that writes, she writes everything on her phone and I just don't, I don't get it. But she's like, yeah, yeah, I just write full, full like, 1500 word articles I'm like on your, on your cell phone she's like yeah yeah and I edit I edit there too I'm like what you, why but that's 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 she that's her workflow and she gets good work done yeah I think for me it's just really because like I'm most productive when I have no access to internet and stuff or it's harder to access because on my laptop when I and I'm connected I obviously have all the distractions that I can go to right but when I'm yeah. in the queue and I'm I just have my mobile so I'll just type without having to think about oh there's notifications or anything and it's just well I don't edit the full article there obviously but I I can draft an article way quicker on my mobile phone than like when I'm sitting on a laptop because I just get distracted like crazy when it, I'm sitting in front yeah. of it. It's it's not great and I I sit with my my phone right next to me so it's like if. Even though I have all the distractions right here, I still will just pick up my phone while I'm on my computer and just like scroll. Like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the biggest problem of remote work, I guess. As, especially like when you're not just talking about us, but normal people moving into remote work, and there's yeah. no office environmental pressure. That's one of the things that you need to be but disciplined I have, about. I have, I have, yeah, that's true. But I have learned. Um, through this course of moving around um, as much as I have like the type of apartment that I need to maximize my productivity. So like in Mexico, for example, I had a, just a studio, everything in one room and it was the worst. I hated it. Um, no separation between, I mean, everyone knows what a studio is, but like no separation between any space. And uh, so like you, you work where you sleep, where you eat, where you shit. And it's just like, really not pleasant because you have no break between anything and on top of that if you if you cook at home like i was like everything smells like what you cook so <laughs> like you have a, just I hated it some people like studios they, that's that's fine but when i came over here the first apartment i had had a couple rooms so a little bit of separation but my desk was in the bedroom and so that i didn't love that moved to split and i had a different setup where i had like it was a duplex so i had a bedroom upstairs the kitchen and then a separate uh sort of room where there was like the living room and office together now here which you, you saw the place fully separate office fully separate living room and, and the dining area fully separate bedroom i realize i need like distinct separations because it mm -hmm. actually like for my headspace it when i leave this room I'm like i don't have to work anymore when i leave you know the bedroom that that part of the day is done uh not everyone needs that but it helps me tremendously to have like very distinct boundaries between things that's very interesting because i was just talking about the same topic with another podcast guest about how the accommodation changes your productivity it's the same case for me although i'm not there into the separation i'm fine with like a studio but i think one of the main takeaways after like going to different airbnbs and different accommodation types throughout like all around the world Mm -hmm. I think I have a better appreciation of like if I were ever to buy an apartment to stay in, what are the criteria that I really, really need? Yeah. Because for me, yeah. daylight or sunlight is very important. Like from here, I like it because, you know, there's just a big window. I can see everything. Mm -hmm. The sun shines in, you know. Whereas I've stayed in an apartment that's like a very good night apartment whereby it's just cozy and at night you just like at 12, you just want to you don't want to sleep. Like you feel like this is yeah. the time to open a bottle of wine and Netflix like your, <laughs> your whole night away just because it's so cozy. I realize yeah. that's just bad for productivity. I think it's good yeah. for holiday vacation. Mm. But but then there are these different knickknacks that I start noticing about 
what do I want in an apartment in order to make myself the most productive and wake up early and do my stuff, you know, get things done. Yeah, that's the, the, the natural light thing is, is a great point. Like the window I have here, it's just the, this is, I mean, this is the, I work from where I'm sitting right now. So like at the whole day, I have natural light coming in and it really, that really does have a huge effect. Uh, but you're also, it's also a good point that now when I, when I end up, if I end up eventually actually getting a place, I, I very much know all the smaller little details, like you mentioned, um, of what I would want in a place. So it makes you, I guess it eventually makes you a better uh, homeowner, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, that's like, that's yeah. like a, a, side, a side benefit of digital nomad life is that you will have an awesome place to live once you decide to stop. Oh, right. Speaking of that, now I remember what I forgot just now. Uh, we were talking about perspective of traveling, right? Let's backtrack a bit. Uh, the mm. other thing that I was saying um, is that when you are traveling as a as a nomad that you're moving slowly, you are noticing a lot more of this long-term stay and knickknacks and like just subconsciously determining whether a place is good for like, you know, getting a permanent residence or like staying mm -hmm. for long. Whereas as a tourist, obviously you think, don't think about that, you know. So mm -hmm. that's the other perspective that really changes. You'll start realizing that, oh, is the public transportation good or like, How's the healthcare system here? And yeah, this, this I, I, I don't know stuff. if that's, I feel like that's just like, I can't tell them just an old person now or, or what, but like, that's definitely <laughs> the things I think about. Like when I got to Mexico, I liked it, but I'm like, mm, do I need, do I need to be right on the water? Like, do I need the beach? Like this sand, if I have sand and I come back, then I have to clean more. It's like, I don't know. And it's like stupid stuff where like, as a tourist, I would go, I don't care. And it doesn't matter. And the public transportation, like, can I walk to things? Uh, what's the gym access like? Is it like it, you really do every place you go as a nomad? I feel like you generally you genuinely are sitting there going like, can I live here forever? Mm. And that's the basis of how you're doing it, not just like is this going to be a good weekend? Totally, totally. I'm I'm feeling the same for sure. I think I think that's going to be a it's just a mindset transition that happens after yeah. after you know a while. Yeah. Uh, so jumping back into the same topic, I would like to talk a lot more about your current job, which is writing, right? So which mm -hmm. area of writing are you into right now? Like, uh, is it copywriting for businesses or article writing or what sort of uh, stuff? It's, it's, it's more copywriting, but it's it's a little bit of everything, but the biggest percentage is copywriting. So I've done some, some newsletter stuff, landing pages, uh, just re regular articles and blog posts for like content marketing purposes, SEO stuff. Um, but gen generally... Uh, I like copywriting, which is ironic because copywriting is like the least recurring of all of those because you, you kind of only need copywriting the one time and then for updates later. But it's, it, it, is a little bit, it is a little bit ironic. That that's like the thing I like the most out of, out of all of them. Because blogging, you know, I had a client, I actually just stopped with them because it, it ran its course. Um, but I was, they, had, they were having to do like 12 blogs a month or something like that or 14 or 16 or something like that I can't remember what it was um and, I, and that that was one of the first recurring ones so I kept that one the longest but it was the same topic at a certain point you just burn out writing the same mm -hmm. thing um but yeah anyways and the main question is is copywriting is is sort of where my silo is in writing that's interesting because I think I think to what you were saying to the point you were saying earlier well, I'm just coming from an outsider's perspective though, but I feel like copywriting, there's a differentiation in that you need the business mindset in order to mm -hmm. copyright properly for businesses. So, and, and that's not something that all writers have. Like, I feel like it's easier for writers to churn out, for example, general blog articles against oh, yeah. business copywriting, you know, because business copywriting, you need that mindset that you understand how to market, whereas mm -hmm. copywriting or blog writing is more like, okay, if you can find the information and you can write relatively well, there's different styles, but chances are you can deliver something of decent quality even. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's probably, well, I have a marketing degree, so that helps. Um, but that the business angle of it is, which is, which is super ironic because I didn't enjoy getting a marketing degree at all like <laughs> but i find that like i, I, I gravitated to it. it's funny with, with like school and, and stuff like even though i have a degree i have an art degree and a business degree i don't really think i learned anything of value yeah it's the wrong way to put it i don't 
all the things I use in a day-to-day -day basis in either video production or writing are things I learned well outside of school, like the basics I might have learned in school, but I don't know if it's necessary to have either degree to do what I do, mm -hmm. um, especially with copywriting, because there's you need to know a lot of business stuff, more about like the audience. I mean, it's more psychological in a way, um, I would say, but I really like it. It's like a puzzle in a way, like you have to figure out, you have to basically piece together this thing that's going to help someone understand what this company or this brand is doing in like 10 words when they land on a page and, and hook them to bring them further down to read how this, whatever their, their client is doing is solving for them. So it's, yeah. it's like, that's kind of what the creativity aspect of it that I like, that it's, it's all solution oriented. And when you have a company that's doing something really interesting, it's fun to figure out how do you frame that to get their, their client or their prospective client in. And I, I really like that, which was, Video had that a little bit, but with music videos, you're not solving the problem. So it's just aesthetics. Um, with product related videos that, that I did, that was more interesting um, in that respect. But writing is fun because you really are just in your own head or you're researching or you're talking, you know, conversations like this, like conversations I have with the client that I'm writing for today. We had like two hours, three hours of conversation about a small section of their website to make sure we, we really nail it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Like, well, I don't generally offer writing as my services, but I know that just because I'm in the design space, there are clients that comes with like a, a very bad piece of writing just because it's, it's like loaded with a truckload of words. And, yeah. and I find it easier to offer copywriting in terms of helping them understand how to structure the text or like what text to remove, what text to include, what kind of CTA mm -hmm. to put versus like, offering a service for article writing for example mm -hmm. right like although i can write my own articles but if i have to go and research on someone else's article and do all those stuff yeah. i think that is way yeah. tougher for me so yeah. i do see that the copywriting has always the advantage and also because the way i stand out in design is the same same thing like i don't i always tell people i don't do design i'm really looking at business design like Mm -hmm. If you are looking just for purely artistic, fancy purpose, I'm mm -hmm. not the guy to come to. But yeah. you're looking for something that practical and drives whatever your business objective is based off like the layout and whatever. That's something that, you know, you can come to me for. So that, that's, that's why the, I think... The, yeah, go on. Honestly, I, th I think the best approach that I've learned with, with work in general um, in anything, but it's specifically, I guess I could speak to writing specifically, but it applies to everything is that if you're not sort of solution oriented, it doesn't really matter how good something looks because it's going to break down. Like if it just, if all it does is look good or sound good, it's not enough to, I mean, like we as consumers look at things that way too. It's like if something looks great and then you pick it up and it's flimsy and it doesn't, and you're like, ah, oh, it's not going to last because there's no integrity to it. So when you're, when you're doing design or you're doing writing or you're creating video, if you're not able to actually understand the problem, it's hard to crack the solution for it, no matter what aspect of, of the process you're in. And that's something where I've learned to be better as someone that like, when I'm ma making proposals and stuff like that, it's all about like, I don't talk about why I'm qualified to talk about whatever problem I have, the solution to it and how I would go about solving it. Never like, oh, I have a degree in this and I've been featured in that. Really nobody cares, it's, it's all about solutions. Yeah, that's a very good point. I definitely want to dive deeper into that. But let's take a step back so we can set some context for that, right? So I understand mm -hmm. that when you move into writing, your, your choice or your first platform that you went to for client sourcing was Upwork, was it? Yeah, yeah. Which I, I learned afterwards, like, people don't love it. <laughs> there's people a lot of frustration with... Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of frustration I found with, with those platforms, Upwork, Free, um, Fiverr, and whatever other ones are out there. Because it, everyone looks at it, or a lot of people look at it as like a race to the bottom, um, with everyone's undercutting everyone else with lower and lower and lower and lower rates. Um, which is that that exists. That's like a lot of the platform. But mm -hmm. I found it to be such a rewarding place to to exist and like generate work and sort of grow uh, a writing business out. That plus it was like I once I decided to do it, there was no chance that I was going to let myself not succeed at it. I, I had nothing else to do with my life at that point. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, I'm not even going to try on multiple platforms. I'm like, I'm going to go on Upwork. I'm going to figure out how to get someone to give me money. 
<laughs> Wait, so so you did not try like Fiverr and like no. all the other writing platforms? No, I, I looked, I looked, I, I had made, so my, when I started that company with my friend, we, he recommended that we have like, and we make an Upwork account and like, I'm like, oh, we, we know enough people, we can just network and get clients. And um, so I made, I made a page in like 2019, but I never touched it. And it was for video production. It wasn't even for writing. So it was in like April, um, April of 2020, where I like, cause you got have a general profile, uh, three profiles underneath one um, mm -hmm. account. So general, I have a content one, uh, content writing one and video production. So I added the writing, made a profile for that. And um, yeah, I, I looked at, I, I briefly looked at Fiverr. I'm like, yeah, this is confusing. Just the interface was confusing. I'm like, nah, I want to deal with it. There's too many things to click. Um, I looked at one other one. I can't remember the name of, and I found a, Upwork the most, I don't know, appealing to me. So I basically, at that point, got rid of everything from my head. And I'm like, this is the only narrow band I will focus on. I will, I'm not going to try and even touch video production. I'm not going to try and touch anything else. I'm gonna, I actually like basically from one day to the next, just declared I was a writer, even though no one had paid me to write at that point. I'm like, that is my identity now. <laughs> and I, I went down that. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, and so you, and so obviously you have you have like quite a bit of success there that's able to build a career that now sustains your lifestyle. Let's talk a bit about how do you succeed on Upwork? Because like obviously I think a lot of people hearing that wants to go into the remote work, a lot mm -hmm. of them probably have thought about the option of freelancing. And when you talk about freelancing, yeah. what's the easiest way to start? For me, I always feel like that is the easiest way to start because you get like leads that are at least warm. So you know mm -hmm. you're pitching for at least a warm lead and not like co-pitching. And, and there's like not a lot of risk because you don't have to do a lot of marketing yourself per se. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the pointers? And, and I specifically would like to ask one thing that you were talking about because we spoke a bit about niches because you were talking about you, you do copywriting, right? Mm -hmm. So both in terms of mindset and your profile setup, do you focus slow, solely on copywriting? Because, okay, one thing for sure to anyone who is listening, you definitely should not be saying I'm both a writer and a designer and a blah, blah, blah. That's definitely not it, right? But mm -hmm. when you select a certain category, like if you choose to be writing, do you find that niching down even based off writing helps a lot? Uh, it does. And I am admittedly, I'm, I'm not even quite there yet myself because I, I, since I didn't have experience in the world of, of writing, um, I didn't know what I would be good at writing at or what I really enjoyed writing. So I, initially I was just literally trying to get professional writing experience, um, mm -hmm. period. And now I'm at the point where like I've had enough clients where I, I, I clearly am gravitating towards tech related stuff. And because a lot of it has been in, in that sort of area, what, what, what problem they're solving is, is sort of whatever, but like it's been describing tech or making basically complex sounding stuff. Cause when you talk to someone that's developed a product, uh, like a SaaS product, they're always like in the weeds on whatever the hell it is. And you're just like, well, okay, a person doesn't need to know all this. Like you need like three things. And so it's, it's bringing other complex into this, into the simple. Um, so I've gravitated towards those types of projects. Um, cause I, I like that, but I haven't actually changed my Upwork profile to reflect that. So right now it's specifically writing. It's not like I do writing and, 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 and. Um, but it's, yes, I, everything I've read and everyone I talk to and even myself with the clients I pick now, it's all niching down slowly. So it's, it, I do need to rebrand re a little bit though with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you spoke a lot about, cause in, in, when it comes to Upwork, it's a lot about proposals and pitching yourself. Right. And I think yeah. just now you mentioned a lot about how to pitch based off uh, being a solution to a problem rather than pitching you as a person. So mm -hmm. tell us more about that and how do you execute that strategy? Yeah, that was, that was like a, a learning curve. Um, Cause initially I would, I would read all like, this is a huge list of jobs that are out there on, on all the platforms. Um, and I would look at ones, first of all, I would find ones when I started with no experience. I'm like, I have to find stuff that I know I could do for sure. Um, now it's gotten to like where if something pops up and I'm like, that's interesting. I could try it. Like I'm more willing to like go outside of my comfort zone. Initially I was like 
there's like three topics I would like. If something travel related came up, like, all right, I definitely can write about a travel thing. So anything that was in very specific band of knowledge, because I wanted to be able to for sure get a good review or for sure complete it um, satisfactory, in a satisfactory way. Um, so that was the initial part. But when I was writing those proposals, it was they were really long initially. I was telling like my whole life story in these things. It was just like, then I did this and I was, when I was five years old, I, I went on this and like, it was just like, I was writing novels, it was taking like two hours to write a proposal. And like, I wrote like 30 or 40 proposals or something like that before people even started responding to me. Um, so it, it was a colossal waste of time in that sense, but it was super valuable in, in learning what gets a response. And I, after reading other people's blogs on like, what I need to be saying and testing out different things. It became, the proposals came, became much shorter and they were very direct. It was like, I would, on Upwork, I would try and find like the person's name. So it wasn't like to whom it may concern because it's not always put there, but you can easily find the name that sort of personalizes a little bit. And then it became, if I could connect with anything personally in the description. So if someone was, I got a job based on the fact that someone was from the state that I'm from pretty much. He reached out to me. He's like, hey, I see you're from Ohio. And like, I was already qualified clearly. So we just talked about Ohio pretty much. And <laughs> it, it was done. Yeah. So I, I tr if I can connect, I'll try and connect very briefly, like with a joke or something quick. And then it's pretty much like, if if I'm able to solve their problem, if they present it very clearly in their um, listing, I'll just directly say, this is what you should do. Here's the solution. Here's, and if, if possible, I'll attach like something that does it. Um, if it's not too long, I'll give them the specific steps um, and basically be like, this is what you should do. This is exactly how I do it. Let's talk and see if we're a good fit for each other. So I don't, I don't even say let's start working. I'm like, I want to know you also because I'm looking at this as a like a two-way street. So if I've gotten interviews with, with clients where it sounded like a good job and I decided not to take it because we weren't a good match like mm -hmm. on a working basis. Like I, I got the feeling that maybe, you know, they were going to be a bit too, not critical, but too demanding and micromanaging for me to get the thing I needed to do done and too many rounds of edits where I'm like, you know what, you might need a different type of writer or they needed something that was like completely out of my wheelhouse um, with very, very direct sales stuff. I'm like, you know what, you might need somebody else. So I always end each proposal with let's talk and see if we're a good fit because I don't know if I'm going to like them as a company and they, they genuinely don't know if they're going to like me. So the quick thing was try and personalize it, get to a solution fast and try and get onto an actual phone call is what I also try and do. Oh, okay. That's, that's interesting. Just a note and add a note for the listeners. I think when you talk about finding the name, I'm not sure how you find it, but one of my best methods is to look at the comments where people that's the way the I feedback. Do it, yeah. 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 So you look look into the reviews and then sometimes the freelancers that have worked with the person previously will be like, oh, John is a very good person to work with or like, you know, yeah. Tim is a good client and that's where you get the name and you want to put that name in the proposal, right? Yeah. That's what you're and saying. I, and, and that's exactly what I'm saying. And when I, when a job finishes, I'll, whenever I write a review back, um, I always put the name in case someone's trying to do the same thing. So I'll always address whoever I worked with and so-and-so was excellent and blah, 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 blah. Um, cause I think it helps. Like when I get an email randomly, like, and it says my name and it's not just like some clearly, you know, copy pasted thing or like a template, you know, you, you react a little bit differently, even if it's just a, a small, tiny thing. It's, I've learned that these little small changes that you sort of make to a profile or to how you're doing something really make it a difference in the, in the bigger picture of the entire proposal. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And to what Steve was saying, I think your last point about really getting the solution across, I think it's a bit also of a mindset change, whereby a lot of freelancers that first come on board, they are probably thinking about clinching a deal, right? So the mm -hmm. mindset is more of like, I don't give a shit what project it is. As long as I think I have a shot at it, I'm going to apply. And the, the, the whole mm -hmm. thought is that, how do I get the client? You know, How do I get yeah. the deal? I think the, the, the good mindset to have is not that. The good mindset is to how do I solve his or her problem even though we might not work together? And that's how you want to craft your proposal. It's almost like a consulting. It's almost like a free consultation session or your, yeah. a free brainstorming session for yourself. Yeah. You think about, okay, this is the problem. How would I 
advise this person regardless whether we will work together or not. And then from that, you, you are able to craft out a response that actually probably has a higher chance of scoring you the deal than just trying yeah. to sell yourself and shit. For sure. And uh, I realized, like, I initially, because I, when I read that you should just be solution oriented, I'm like, oh, but I'm going to give away ideas and like, I'm not going to get credit or I'm not going to get the job and they're just going to have my ideas. And I realized it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're in the, if you're in the business, which everyone as a freelancer technically is of solving problems, like there's enough problems in the world that if someone takes one of your ideas, you don't get credit for it. It's fine. You've, you've, you're setting yourself up for more ideas to come because if you're actually putting things out there, um, it's much more important than waiting until you get the opportunity, giving that solution and then it not being correct, you know, because mm. that's another thing. People are like, oh, I don't want to say too much because, you know, I think this is definitely the right way to do it. It's not always the case. Like just because you think an idea is good, you need a real world tested. So I always try and do that now, which with these proposals, so I'll send something out. And if they don't like it, if they don't respond, that's one thing. But sometimes I'll be like, all right, so what didn't you like? You hire somebody else that's better. That's fine. I don't care. What, mm -hmm. what, what would you be looking for? And so I look at everything now from a different perspective, which was before, like you mentioned, I need to get this. I don't care how I get this. I just want to get this to, this is a learning opportunity, even if I don't get it. So you kind of end up winning no matter what you do, if you start to have that approach to stuff and are, are much more process oriented and less like if you focus on the, only the goal, you're not really getting better at, at producing results. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you mentioned something very interesting because your goal was to, your next step goal was to get on a call, right? Whereas uh, mm -hmm. I, I never like calling because just, just because of a few reasons, one of which is that the moment I have to call, it means that I have to schedule time with someone and that automatically mm -hmm. re reduces my flexibility of schedule, right? Because now I need to arrange time with someone. So that has always been something that I try to eliminate from uh, my lifestyle in any sense, like having to be at the same place at the same time with a certain person reduces mm -hmm. flexibility, right? So how much time then do you spend between working on projects, uh, prospecting, clients or like applying for new proposals and also like trying to prospect the client base of calls because it seems like now you have three things to handle all at one time. Yeah. Um it's a good question. Well now I've been I've been sort of we kind of talked about this last night, but like I've been doing other stuff that has, <laughs> has sort of kept, kept me and I won't you have go not into been it here, disciplined. <laughs> I've not been, yeah, I've been, I've been traveling around, I've been enjoying Croatia a little bit too much, let's say. And uh, so I, I had my clients, I'm still producing good work for them, but I haven't spent the, the adequate amount of time that I, I had planned earlier in the year. So I had certain goals and I had, I had to recalibrate just because certain other opportunities came up throughout the year, which weren't financial, but were made in my life much richer. So I decided to take that and then leave, leave the work sort of on that level. But in the past, before that, uh, the nice thing, by the way, about Upwork is that once you get traction on there and get a, a high rating, people start asking you to propose stuff to them. Um, so I don't look at the job boards anymore at Upwork. I have, when I put my availability on, I get like six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different proposal, proposal requests that come to me now. So like, I pretty much only look at that now. So I spend not very much time looking at stuff. If anything interesting comes into those requests, I'll, I'll make a proposal for those. Um, the last one that hired me, which was two, two weeks ago, um, well, that's what I'm working on today. We, they said, hey, can you apply for this? Or can you send us a proposal for this? They, they liked what I said. We jumped, I did say, let's get on a call and talk. And uh, I, the reason I do that, by the way, is it's, it's harder to say no to somebody when you're talking to them. It's much easier to say no when you're typing to them. So I like that aspect of it. And two, it's uh, you could really feel out like their personalities and kind of what they're going for, certain things that are missed in text. Um, when they say something is important in a text document, as opposed to when they tell you, you might find that there's a whole different element or a whole different layer that they, they don't realize is important but they're repeating the same thing over and over and over again, but they hadn't written that. So like, there's a lot of like the deeper dive into the content creation aspect. That's why I like the call, but that's, that's later in the process. But yeah, the prospecting aspect of it, 
it's not a huge chunk because of the benefit of, of Upwork and, and being like, I'm like top rated plus on their side, like their highest ranking and 100% success score. So it's not a lot of effort. But you mentioned just now, I'm pretty sure this is not a common case, but you mentioned you spent like two, three hours speaking to the client on discussing like, you know, the, the, the work. That's already that one, a, yeah, that's, that's already one it's in. That's already in, that's already like in a work phase. Um, on the initial okay. calls, on those like feel, feeling them out calls, uh, those are usually, they've been like a half hour typically. Got it, got it, got it. Then that's interesting. The other thing that you mentioned just now that is, that is quite surprising for me was that I know that Apple has this system whereby, you know, if your profile is public and people can just pitch to you or like send you an invitation to apply. But mm. I would say most of the freelancers I've spoken to find that that particular things that the, the jobs that comes through that particular stream is not very relevant. You know what I mean? Like, like it feels like a lot I mean, of them a, are very weird a, stuff. No, I mean, it's a, I mean, that's kind of it. Depends on how your profile is set up, depends on what your price point is and, and things like that. So like one of my favorite clients that I have right now, <clears throat> it's a tech company and uh, really great. They're, they're a fairly large company. They're, like, they're, it's a solid company. And uh, that came through them, them basically seeing my profile, saying they like the tone, how, how I wrote my profile. Like we like that tone. We want how you wrote your profile to be what our brand sounds like. Um, and they found me that way. So it's like, there is a lot of shit that comes through that way, but there's a lot of shit everywhere. It's a matter of like how you're looking at, at, at stuff. So like for me, yeah, I, a, a lot of the things I get, I mean, are not relevant to my life and that's fine. They need somebody to write it. They'll find somebody, but there's, there's good things. And um, I guess it's how you look at it. I look at, I look at, at that as a free pipeline for work where I don't have to spend any effort and I'll get, you know, if I'm available, a bunch of those will come through a week. Like I think there's seven or eight in my Upwork thing right now. Mm, yeah, I think if you can get that running uh, to your advantage, like it really passes you relevant leads, right? That's actually a very, that's going to be a huge time saver as your pipeline gets every, tighter. Every, because... every job I've gotten on Upwork in the last six months has come that way. I haven't looked at mm. them even longer, probably. I haven't, I haven't actually gone to the main feed of work i haven't used any of those like with, i don't even know what their currency is called the connect or whatever yeah i haven't used yeah. i haven't used any of those um in in a year probably like as soon as it started gaining traction and those proposal requests started coming in to me i'm like this saves so much time on prospecting like maybe it's not the exact thing but it gave me a it helped me learn my niche better um and it helped me problem solve a lot better by only responding to the random shit that came in, uh, which is which was interesting because it's like you become you become more aware of what you're capable of solving and not solving if you're very confined to like one silo of or one avenue of stuff. So I I, I guess I'm just challenge oriented in that sense. I like like having to think about things in different ways. So the one company is that I would that I would just mentioned they do like website planning software. The one that I'm doing today is related to like real estate stuff. So it's they're, all, they're both tech, but that's vastly different in how you're going to write that and how you're going to solve that the problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think the, the problem you have is a very good problem to have, actually. Like, like <laughs> as long as they're relevant leads, that's like the best. Because I do know that. So one of the biggest difference between Upwork and Fiverr is that more, more often than not, Upwork is more application-based, whereby you have to apply. That has always been the, the so-called how they function. And they are trying to duplicate a bit of the Fiverr model whereby you are starting to have these gigs that you can set up. and mm -hmm. But it hasn't taken off particularly on Upwork yet. So I have no idea what they're trying to do. Whereas Fiverr was always a more sales space, you know, whereby the client comes in and they are like shopping for service, like an e-commerce platform. You don't apply to anything, which, yeah. makes, which takes out the prospecting time. And that means income or like leads come in regardless of whether you are doing anything. Whereas in Upwork, you you don't have that problem because obviously you are getting very good leads from the the invitations. Now, now I, I definitely had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> so before that, it was a problem, right? Like like you have to. Yeah, no, I was. I, I, I mean, like I was spending count, countless hours, like sifting through the listings, um, applying stuff, not hearing back. Like that the whole the whole like this is good now because it's been over like 
almost two years of like clearing it out. But the first six months, first five months or whatever were just like nothing. I mean, the first thing I got paid for on Upwork was $18. Like, you know, that's, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, I, but so but, you went with the matter of like, let's start small and low price first and then gain the reviews and traction and then skyrocket. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I needed, I needed someone externally to validate that I was a writer and uh, cause I believed it in my head, but I needed somebody to give me some money to prove that like, and it was literally the first thing maybe it was, yeah, it was 18 bucks was the, the first one I remember. And uh, it was like 600 words. So it's not like, none of this was good, <laughs> but it was the, 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 the important thing was like, when I hit the account, I'm like, I've now been paid to write something. I'm, I'm a professional writer now that in my head, was a turning point. So I'm like, all right, now I'm pro. Didn't matter if it was only 18 bucks. It was, it was, it was monumental for me. It was huge. It was not even the price of like two burritos at Chipotle. But like it it was the little small win. And that's I think a big thing that people overlook, which is what I overlooked in the past too with like the video production. I was trying to only hit home runs, but it's like small wins are so much more important to achieve and go after and celebrate than a big win. Like a big one, they'll all come if you're able to sort of create these small little tiny steps along the way and and do them confidently and confidently. Yeah, for sure. And they stack up, like the small wins definitely stack up to a lot after that when you are like, uh, when you don't. Yeah, I mean, like a, for, for me back then, uh, to think that I could actually just make a, an actual living doing writing, and I'm not making like insane amount of money, but to to have it be very comfortable to like travel and live and you know be in europe and do kind of whatever i want um that's crazy to me like i didn't think that was possible when i started on upwork because i couldn't get anyone to even read my proposals initially <laughs> but i i saw a screenshot of the the stats that you post regarding the response rate of uh mm -hmm. clients to your proposal and profile i think that's a pretty high rate to be able to yeah achieve. It's, it's yeah it's basically um less i think i need to change my profile a little bit because it's like stats were like my profile is seen less often but people interview and hire me it's like maximum so if someone sees my profile and they reach out to me and they talk to me they will hire me that's pretty much how it works now um mm -hmm. not because i'm like an i'm not like an exceptionally gifted writer i'm not the best writer on the planet but i'm not focusing on being the best writer on the planet i'm focusing on solving their particular issue as well as I can for them. Um, and that's the only thing. So I'm not, I don't advertise myself as being like a, an incredible writer. I advertise it as solving a problem. Mm, mm. That sounds like a good angle. I think, I think the way you can differentiate, the more you can differentiate yourself, the better it is. So uh, what's next? Like, are you planning to scale on Upwork? Are you planning to scale outside of Upwork? What do you think is your next path? Uh, I, I want... I want to be more off the platform. Um, I want to keep both, but like the fees are, no one loves fees. So like I want to try and not have to pay the fees, um, but it's such a good avenue because it's such a big market uh, on there. I want to I want to build something off, off platform though. And that's, that's getting interesting because I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And that's what I want to devote sort of the next, half a year to sort of developing a plan for and and putting that into action and if that involves bringing in some other people because uh, i also i also don't like that i'm declining so much work um because like things are coming that i like and i'm just like i just i just don't have the bandwidth and so i need to, I, I either need to take it subcontract it out and then pay somebody else to do it and just man manage quality but that's always been scary to me because right now and in the past i've done everything so like with video even i would shoot the video i would edit the video i would produce the video and that would it makes it you can't grow that way <laughs> yeah that's difficult that's difficult definitely you have to start to hands off some stuff yeah so i think i think that the, the big challenge for me is going to be this, this that first step of onboarding a client that i know i'm not going to actually do the writing for and mm -hmm. I, I think i'm getting close to that point um because I'm just, like, there's been really good stuff that you have to miss if you're just afraid to subcontract out and like just manage. So 
that's that's the thing. Once I can successfully do that and make a plan of action for that, I think I can. I'd like to have some sort of maybe like a little writing agency kind of thing doing marketing of that nature. But we'll we'll see. It's uh, the, the beautiful thing is that there's actually a lot of opportunities out there um, for 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 people, especially for freelancers. There's so many companies that are looking to to do stuff right now. Yeah, yeah. The, oh, that's the thing. Also, more... one one more. One more thing about Upwork um, and and pricing. Um, for, I think it probably ap- applies to to Fiverr too, but I'm not sure how the pricing works there. How does it work on Fiverr actually? You you price your own stuff and then people just buy it or they don't buy it or, or what? Yeah, you price. Yeah, uh, everything is a package, so you price off like a certain scope of work, and then there will be mm-hmm. a price for it, and then people can just buy it. And then okay. you can add like certain add optional add-ons that you can add to it. So people okay. can buy that as well. So everything is almost like shopping for a product. Okay, this is the product. Mm, okay. And if you want like extra accessories, you can add the extra accessories and then you you just make the sale. Okay, so it's yeah, so it's totally different than Upwork, which is like you put your rate and then all that kind of stuff. And yeah, they have their they have their own budget and blah blah. Um the one thing I wanted to add on on the Upwork side then is ignore the number that the client puts there just ignore it and but and price it how you think it's worth they don't the, the reason i say that is because often uh i was a this was a problem for me i'm like oh that seems like it's not enough for for the amount of time i would put in it turns out people don't know what shit is supposed to cost and that's not yeah. because they're trying to they're not trying to be cheap they just, they're, they're, they're like well how writing shouldn't cost more than 30 dollars or something and you're like no no that's like that's like 900 dollars project or something and you and you explain it to them and then they're like oh okay so I, I i ignore whatever they put and i just put what i think it's supposed to be and that actually works i mean they, they don't disregard your proposal if you if you put something much higher or even a little bit higher, like my my rate, I routinely will see something and I'll put a higher number than what my actual rate is. And no one ever sits there and goes, well, it says says it's this much. No one says that. Oh, you justify that's it interesting. Well. Okay, it's, okay. It's, so that means you have an hourly rate that you put in the profile, but you don't usually put that rate. You put something higher when you apply. It's, yeah, if it demands it, like in a, especially if it's like a company that's that's, you clearly know they're a larger company and it's like, it's going to convert into sales that are significantly higher. And like, if it's a small company, I'll, I'll go down sometimes also where it's like, okay, there, this is like a, a coach that's just starting out like a fitness business or something. Like I'm not going to go the highest rate. Like it's, I can go, I can go lower, but like I've had it where a company, a company that hired me recently, they, they're like, Hey, can you meet us a little bit lower on the price? I'm like, no, cause I'm not, it's not a negotiation. That's what it says. That's what it costs. I'm not, like not everyone has the luxury to do that, obviously. But what, once you get confident in the value you're giving to people um, and the fact that they're going to end up making more money off of that on the back end, you can feel comfortable standing your ground and saying, "No, it, it is worth this. You're going to get the result because you're going to market off of this." Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good mindset to have, especially when you are in the in the positioning of doing something that's business related mm-hmm. and the ROI. It's like there's a correlation to the ROI. I think that's obvious. You're you're looking at it not just as like you charging the client, but really that you are helping them make more money and you're just taking a piece of what they're gonna make. They're yeah. still going to make, you know. So that's exactly. that's always yeah. that's always Purple. good. And that, yeah, and, and I think uh, it's also understanding understanding the mindset of clients. I I think a lot of people might feel like if I'm going to a platform and buying something, I'm just looking at the cheapest price thing, which mm-hmm. is not always the case for all clients. I would say most clients are looking for the thing, like it's almost the same case. Like if I were to pay, if I were to pay $50 and make me like $100 without me having to do anything. So I pay someone $50 and $50 just comes into me. That's mm-hmm. better than me paying $10 and then I have to do like a whole bunch of shit before yeah. coming back like with another yeah. $50, you know? So it's, it's really reducing the time for the client. That's, I think, what sells the best, especially for good clients. Oh, for sure. And I mean, that type of tactic with the pricing thing, if it's blogs, it's harder to, to sort of be like, I need a higher rate. For copy, it's a lot easier because it's like, this mm-hmm. is the front page of 
this is what you're, you're literally sending people to this page. Like if it's not good, you're not going to, they're not going to click. They're not going to buy. They're not, it's not going to convert. So to spend 10% more than you want to get whatever your, you know, sales targets are, it's, it's going to be worth it. And so like speaking, that's where the business thing comes into play um, and the marketing and the ability to like think on a business side and, and really understanding clients is another thing that Upwork taught me. And I think Fiverr probably does, but it, but less so because Upwork, you're forced to deal with these types of situations. You're forced to like have people, hey, can you do it for less? And then you have to really think like, can I, or are they taking advantage? Because when I go shopping, I want the cheapest price too. It's like everybody that's going out there for anything is going to ask for a discount. But when you're the person being asked, you have to then say, is this, do I discount myself? Um, and it's usually you could just say no and they don't care. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very case by case basis. Like what you say, I think it's good that you get insights into consumer behavior, customer behavior, and, and it's something to, that helps you grow just, professionally. Yeah, but every, every, everyone's a consumer. So it's like, it's easy when we go to a market or something and something says it's like $40 and you're like, yeah, can you, can you do 30? And they're like, nah, I can do 35. And so like, you know, you, you meet halfway, but it, same thing applies when you're, when you're doing jobs. Like, hey, can you come down a little bit? And if you genuinely can and you, you like the relationship, then yeah, go down a little bit. But I've definitely, you know, I don't think giving discounts is wise in general. Like if your price is your price, um, you should stay with it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. So let's conclude with a series of quick fire questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's your best remote work tip? Best remote work tip. This is supposed to be quick, and I have like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I would say find a place that cost of living makes sense for, for whatever you're like, making or your budget, or your lifestyle is. Um, it, there's nothing worse than being in a place where you can't afford simply because like you think it's cool to be there or something. Um, so I'd say if you're going to work remote, which is I think most people do this anyways, find a place that you genuinely can live a lifestyle that helps you grow whatever business you're doing and, and, and enjoy the place that you're in. Nice, nice. And what's your top travel tip? Stay hydrated. <laughs> That's actually important. That's actually a very good tip. Uh, okay. What are three things in your travel backpack that you cannot leave without removing phones and laptop, obviously, because those are important. Right. But what are three other items? Um, headphones of some kind. What else? Sunglasses. <laughs> and... It's weird. None of these are really useful, but I, I need them. Um, the third one that I can't live without. Some type of hat. Like a hat? Nothing is, not, yeah, none of these are useful tips, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, had, no I mean, worries. I, when you got rid of like, my phone and my laptop were, I, I like the, the, the main two that I need. Everything else. Or actually, you know what? Um, I would say like a notebook of some kind. I have multiple notebooks. So I would say a notebook. Um, it, I like it. I can jot down ideas. I, I always have a notebook. So um, that would be one, actually. And okay, last one. Um, what's your favorite travel destination so far? Uh, I love Croatia. So I've been here for a long time. New, New Zealand is, is incredible. But those are the two places I've, I've lived um, the longest outside of the US. So they're very high, uh, one and two. I'd say other than that, I really liked... Um, I like anything with nature and mountains. So like, I really like Nepal. I really like Peru. Uh, but yeah, Croatia and, and New Zealand probably going to have to be. And then Italy, I would say. Oh, interesting. Cool, cool. And tell the audience where they can find you either for your tr- your writing services or like, you know, if they want to uh, follow you because you are like good looking and stuff and, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm actually shaved today. I, clean, I put on like a decent shirt and I, I yeah, so you're lucky. Um, the, pe- the, pe- the people are lucky. The people watching are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I see you every day. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. So you're, yeah, you're like, you're like, you don't look better than always. Um, but Instagram is finally dot made dot it, um, which is, it's all travel stuff, it's mostly Croatian stuff. Uh, Francis and I, speaking of France, we started a, a Facebook group, um, which 
is devoted to digital nomads, freelancing, entrepreneur stuff, um, which has the most generic name ever. It's basically like digital nomad, freelancers and entrepreneurs, I think is what we called it. So they can find us there. Are you going to, I mean, we need to put some links somewhere, but yeah. Uh, and then my, my company, my video production company is SBT Productions. And that's just video stuff. My writing, I actually only have an upward profile, which is I'm, I'm horrible. I don't want to say that about myself, but I don't have like a writing portfolio. Literally, I don't have a writing website. I've been doing all of my business without having a place to send people. So it's Upwork and then I get referrals. Um, so imagine how much better I can be doing if I just had like a genuine place where people can come. <laughs> you you should probably shout out LinkedIn as you have a LinkedIn, right? Do you? Oh shit, LinkedIn. Yeah, I got LinkedIn. I need I need yeah. a, I need a, I need like a VA is what I need. I think I think your stuff are all over the place, but don't worry. We will put like the links in the notes or something so people can yeah, put the links in the notes because like like LinkedIn, but like my name is so hard to spell, so people really need to like. Right. right, that's yeah. That was the biggest problem when I was trying to look for your your CNBC feature. I was like, Steve, uh, Steve, what? I was like, shit, I don't know. Us. Let's put Steve CNBC. I was like, still not thinking. Steve CNBC Croatia Digital Nomad. I was like, okay, finally I found something. Yeah, I, I need to I need to work on that. I need to work on that. But uh, I'm actually, I should have another CNBC article about digital nomads coming out um sometime relatively soon. I don't know. They, they, they need to edit it and we need to go over it. But like, so that there should be another thing on CNBC coming out soon, speaking of that. Sounds good. So I'll put your links. Uh, I mean, like for the viewers, the links will be in the show notes uh, and you can find Steve there and hit him up with any questions you have. And the Facebook group seems really interesting. So if you're into freelancing, go look into it because Francis is another guy that does uh, started off freelancing and does email marketing and stuff. He's in my podcast in the previous episode. If you want to check it out. Um, but yeah, thanks, Steve, for coming on today. Thank you, man. Looking forward to seeing you out here in a little bit.